Okay. Just give me a moment. The pen is not writing. All right. <clears throat> so basically, the thermionic emission. The uh, idea is very simple. That uh, let's take a metal. And why are we considering a metal? Because we are looking at Fermi gases. And metal is a um, uh, is a good representation of a free electron gas, right? So uh, if a metal is heated, then it can emit electrons. Okay. So which means that at temperature equal to zero, it will not emit. But at any finite temperature, there is a possibility of emission of electrons. And if you heat it more and more, the probability of emission of electrons keeps on increasing. OK, and uh, this is basically the concept of thermionic emission. This is related to temperature and you're basically ionizing the metal. So that's why this is called thermionic emission. And uh, this has uh, several applications. So earlier vacuum tubes or these electron tubes, they were built using uh, this concept, the thermionic emission. Uh, and then th this had implications for computers, for uh, long distance telephony and so on, long distance uh, communication. And then uh, <clears throat> even today there are many applications including uh, high frequency vacuum transistors for electronics okay and then <clears throat> you can have uh, electron guns if you want to use them for scientific instrumentation and uh, uh, it's also useful thermionic emission is also useful in power electronics where let's say you are uh, the electronics is not low voltage, but it's high power electronics. And then uh, you want to use them for X-ray generation. Okay. And you can also use them for energy converters. So from high temperature sources and solar energy. OK, so it's an important concept. It has a lot of applications and uh, the graph corresponding to thermionic emission looks something like this. Let's say this is U. This is the potential applied. OK, I will describe to you what is U and this is the current. OK, this is current density. So if I plot the current density as a function of potential and let me first tell you what is the circuit that I'm describing. This is the circuit. This is uh, again from this whole topic is from Iback and Luth. So you can look it up for more details. OK, so this is the anode. And this is the vacuum tube. So inside this there is vacuum and this is the cathode. The cathode is, uh, let's say, heated. And it's also connected to the negative of this. And there is a potential here. And, and this is an ammeter which measures the variable current. OK, so this is U. So this is the potential applied uh, with respect or between the, this is the bias between the anode and the cathode. And the cathode is heated, so it's basically emitting electrons. And the potential difference between these two controls the current that comes out uh, or that goes on goes in from the cathode to the anode. So how does the current look like? It looks in as like this. So this is for a certain temperature. This, there is a saturation here. This is for a certain temperature T1. And if I increase the temperature, then it looks something like this. OK. So <clears throat> this is an interesting graph. OK, why is this interesting? So let's focus first on U equal to zero, which means there is no bias at all. Right. So if there is no bias, then it's pure thermal emission. 
so i am just heating the cathode the electrons are coming out and they are hitting the anode and because of that i get a current j right so that is this value and as you can see if i am increasing the temperature then this current density is actually increasing so which means there is a higher probability of the electrons to come out and hit the anode right and this is all happening at zero bias the question is suppose i apply an opposite bias right which means the anode is at negative with respect to this with respect to the cathode then what is happening is that even then we are getting a current okay the current is not zero right the current is actually finite which means that the electrons have sufficient energy to cross that barrier and hit the anode even though there is a negative potential and of course when the potential is positive then it basically attracts the electrons and the current increases but then uh, the current does not increase uh, infinitely okay there is a saturation current which means that at any temperature there is only a finite probability of taking out electrons from the cathode okay so <clears throat> what you see here is that the process that is important for thermionic emission is that electrons have to be taken out of the cathode right so given a particular temperature we want to see how many electrons are able to escape the uh, fermi gas okay so that is basically the question okay so is this clear now are there any doubts doubts at this point no no sir can you repeat what we are going to find i'm sorry uh, uh, what we are going to find oh, in okay, that okay. yeah yeah sure the, so right right sir. yeah so i was saying see uh, you can see that this is actually a saturation current right so even if yeah. we go on applying the potential and go on increasing it we can't increase the current beyond a certain value okay so that is yeah. called the yeah. saturation current this is called js and the objective that we will be i mean the, the objective that we will be trying to achieve is to find the saturation current using fermi gas theory okay is the objective clear now okay. yeah and is the setup clear yeah right. setup is also clear yeah good so <clears throat> now uh, let me just remove this okay so what we had done earlier to understand a fermi gas was there were two models we had taken one was open boundary conditions and the other was periodic boundary conditions okay so and both of them what we saw was that either the fermi surface is the first octant in k space okay and in the open boundary conditions case what we took as the model was an infinite potential well infinite potential well so the electrons are basically inside this inside this potential well and they are free to move and what we saw was that there were these levels that were formed and these were defined by k values and the highest occupied level was basically the fermi energy okay so this was basically the solution of a particle in a box problem now in the periodic boundary conditions what we said is that the sides of the box connect to the opposite side right so in that sense again electrons cannot escape right so wherever the electrons go they will basically come back into the solid okay so that is effectively saying that the electrons cannot actually escape the solid okay so even the periodic boundary conditions is in a loose sense <coughs> related to the infinite potential well okay we are basically saying that there is an infinite potential wall at any real space surface of a material okay but obviously an infinite potential well is not a real system is not a real model it's only an ideal model okay Uh, and to be realistic what we should consider is that we should consider that there is a finite barrier okay finite barrier for the electrons 
and what is that finite barrier right that is a very difficult question okay to actually find what is this finite barrier you have to use concepts which are work function you have to know the concept of the fermi energy and related concepts are ionization energy electron affinity and so on not only this the surface physics of the material is actually extremely important and any tiny changes in the surface can actually lead to drastic changes in the work function okay so <clears throat> the point is that we will assume that the work function is an experimentally determined quantity okay and to in order to compute the work function one has to Uh, start from the surface okay one has to know the band structure as well one has to know concepts like band bending and uh, work function is defined basically as the energy to take out the electron at least in the metals to take out an electron at the fermi energy and put it outside the metal but close to the metal okay and close enough so that the electron feels the dipole that has been created okay because when you take out the electron from the metal then the electron has a negative charge and the uh, and the metal that the electron left behind has a positive charge right so there will be a surface charge redistribution because we have taken out the electron and that will create a dipolar field okay so the electron has been taken out but it has been taken out not too far okay oh by the way there is also another concept here called vacuum level okay so there are all these different kinds of concepts and the work function is the energy to take out the electron from inside the metal okay from the bulk of the metal at the fermi energy right up to the surface of the metal but just outside okay not far from the metal if you take it far from the metal then you are taking it to the vacuum level if you are taking it just outside so that it feels the dipolar field and it is not completely free that is called the work function okay and the work function is a very very sensitive function of the surface properties which means if you cleave a certain metal at the 100 surface or the 111 surface or any different surface you can get different work functions okay uh, not only that if you add a little bit of impurities or if there are uh, uh, if there is something called a surface reconstruction that can happen so there are steps that can get created that can also change the work function okay and thin layers of adsorbates if you adsorb a certain gas on a certain metal for example that can also change the work function drastically okay so the work function is a very sensitive quantity and what i would suggest is that there is a particular article that i am going to show you now this is an article that has appeared in 2016 in materials horizon so just make a note of this this is called fermi level work function and vacuum level and it's a review article and it explains all of these concepts very nicely okay so this is the concept that we need to understand thermionic emission why do we need it simply because when we are heating the metal the electrons are coming out right and to come out they have to cross a certain barrier right what is that barrier is the question okay and the barrier is that the electrons have to be at the fermi energy and they have to cross the work function so they have to have an energy which is at least equal to the fermi energy plus the work function okay in order to escape the metal so that is basically the idea okay so let me <coughs> uh, write down uh, the work function Uh, definition first of all it's the energy uh, yeah sir i have a question yes sir uh, we are taking out electron from fermi level uh, yeah. it is in uh, energy uh, energy space now if we go if we look into the real space the uh, electron may come out from any uh, any layer of uh, it is not obvious that it will come out from the surface then if the electron come from the a uh, few deeper uh, deeper layer then we can it um, lose some energy due to some scattering or uh, collision uh so there are several processes you're right 
uh, but what would happen is finally when the electron comes out then it's going the easiest thing is to take it out of the surface okay so we are asking what is the minimum energy barrier needed to be overcome do you understand yes sir yeah the other thing is see the there are quite a few complications in this first of all when we look at the uh, surface physics of a metal the surface energy band structure is, is actually different from the bulk energy band structure okay the simple reason is when we calculate band structure of a certain material we are assuming an infinite potential well okay and we assume that the barrier for the electrons to escape is infinite however if you consider that the barrier for the electrons to escape is finite and you take into account these electrostatic aspects that when the electron is just outside the material you have to have a image charge which is inside and there is a dipole that is formed if you take into account those con those considerations also the band structure will turn out to be quite different okay so i have not gone deeper into the concepts here let me just uh, okay let me do a digression here because there is a, there are a lot of questions related to work function fermi energy ionization energy and so on and the uh, what i am going to tell you now might clarify some of those things okay so let me first ask you this question let me uh, so shovik you can mute yourself i will ask specific people now so uh, ashish are you online yes sir yeah so suppose i take a sodium atom okay okay what is the electronic configuration uh, 1s2 yeah 2s2 okay 2p6 okay 3s1 exactly okay good so if i want to look at the sodium atom and look at the energies of these electrons let's say i want to look at the energy of this electron in the 3s hmm? okay sir then what does the bohr's model tell me what is uh, the minus 13.6 uh, okay electron volt sir uh, no that is only for the hydrogen atom Uh, for uh, it will be by z atomic number sir not by z no into n square actually z squared by n squared oh, oh sir okay. okay so this is the energy of the uh, electrons in the nth shell okay so if i apply this here okay uh, then what will i get for n equal to 3 for the outermost electron i would get something like minus 13.6 into 11 squared by 3 squared which is 9 Okay, mm -hmm. so 121 by 9, which is uh, roughly around uh, say 10, 11, 12, 13. Okay, yes. so this will be roughly minus 13 squared. Yes. Okay, which is uh, in electron volts, which is a very large number. Okay, basically what we are saying is, if we have taken the hydrogen atom, then we know that the ionization energy of the hydrogen atom is basically minus uh, is basically 13.6 electron volts. Yes. Correct. Yes. Sir. Now, what does the ionization energy represent? Sir, how much energy we require to uh, remove electron from? Correct. Correct. Cell? So, in the same way, if we use the Bohr's model for calculating the sodium atom ionization ionization energy, we would get something like 169 electron volts, something like 170 yes. electron volts, right? Y yes, sir. Okay. But now, let me move on to the next person. Sorry, I keep clicking the wrong button. uh yeah you can mute yourself so anushup are you online yes sir yeah so uh, anushup do you know what is the ionization energy for uh, sodium some 400 kJ per mole that's uh, yeah that's a good number but can you tell me in electron volts what would that be it's okay i'll tell you it's about 5.5 electron volts okay but the bohr's model tells me it's minus 
it's uh, about 170 electron volts right yeah. why is there such a discrepancy between the ionization energy computed experimentally uh, or obtained experimentally and uh, that one and the and the value computed using bohr's model why is there such a discrepancy so there is screening by the inner inner shell electrons absolutely absolutely so there is a screening going on and this energy is calculated assuming that the nucleus and the electron they interact directly right there there is vacuum in between the electron and the nucleus that's how this energy is calculated however because there are inner electrons they screen the potential of the nucleus and that's why you get a much lower ionization energy very nice okay but this is for an isolated sodium atom correct yes sir okay now the work function for, for sodium turns out to be about 2.3 electron volts okay see we are discussing here the ionization energy which is the energy required to take an electron out of the isolated sodium atom okay but when we talk about a work function then we talk about bulk sodium correct yes sir so bulk sodium means so this is a single sodium atom and now we are talking about a crystal and if i want to take out an electron from inside the crystal to outside the crystal right and place the electron just a few nanometers away from the surface i need 2.3 electron volts okay yes sir now tell me why is there a discrepancy here so there is interaction with the other other atoms present Absolutely. in the atoms. yes and what does that do what does the so yeah it's absolutely correct there is an interaction with other atoms so we are not talking about an isolated atom here so uh, what effect does this interaction with the other electrons have on the energy levels so what does uh, molecule what does uh, how do molecular level differ from atomic level are they the same no right no sir if we take a hydrogen molecule versus a hydrogen atom the molecular levels are different correct yes sir and for every level in the hydrogen atom isn't there a bonding and anti bonding yes sir so wouldn't you expect something similar to happen when two yeah, sodium atoms in then conduction band will be formed well okay the uh, not just a valence band and conduction band remember there are isolated levels in the sodium atom right yes sir and each level is corresponds to a certain wave function okay over and this periodic structure the energy level structure also changes drastically and you get a series of bands it's not only two bands okay okay so and uh, these series of bands when you when we start filling up these electrons then we reach a certain highest occupied level right which will be within some band for sodium because sodium is a metal and that will be called the conduction band of sodium yes sir okay so there is a certain fermi energy also okay so what we are saying is that even though the energy required to take out an electron from sodium from an isolated sodium atom is 5.5 because of the band formation the energy required to take out an electron from the sodium crystal is lowered okay it's 2.3 electron volts correct yes, sir. yeah so the uh, and uh, yeah you can mute yourself thanks <coughs> so the idea is that there are several concepts here which have gone into uh, 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 the uh, work function concept okay so it's not a very easy concept to uh, compute because you have to combine both electromagnetic theory as well as quantum mechanics in order to be able to compute this work function okay so <clears throat> if you look at the schrodinger's equation alone you have the potential okay uh, or let's say the atomic potential the periodic potential but then you have to stop the periodicity because you are considering in a, an open system okay you are considering a real surface from which you have to take out the electrons 
Now, how do you model a surface? Okay, do you model it with a finite potential? Uh, and how should that potential be? Should that potential be abrupt? Or should that potential have some sort of a form? Okay, and when the dipole forms, the electron forms a dipole when it goes out to the surface, that potential is a self consistently determined potential. Okay, that has to be included in the Schrodinger's equation, but it has to be done self consistently. Okay, and that's a that's quite a difficult problem. So let me not go into the details of the solution of that problem. But now I hope I can uh, you know motivate you to understanding that the work function is related to the band theory. It's related to the ionization energy of isolated atoms and so on. Okay, so one can start from those concepts and start to understand the work function. But a full understanding of the work function involves a lot of surface physics. It involves the solution of Schrodinger's equation and the Poisson's equation put together. Okay, so uh, Shovik, uh, does this answer your questions to some level? Yes, sir. I quite understand. Okay. Yeah. So let me go ahead. Okay. So what we are going to do is we are going to calculate the saturation current. So the objective that we have in front of us is calculate the saturation current. So let me remind you once again, the saturation current is the current that we obtain for a very large potential. Okay. So this is U, this is J, and this is anode, this is cathode, this is uh, cathode and this is heated. And there is a potential difference between these and there is a current. Okay, so that is basically the setup. <clears throat> Good. So to calculate this, I want to know what is the current density. And the current density can be very simply calculated as Jx. Okay, it's just given by E by V times sum over K of Vx of K. Okay. Now let me ask. Uh, Dipanjana, are you online? Yes, sir. Yeah. So now given this Jx expression, should I consider all the K values available to me in the Brillouin zone or should I make a restriction on this K? What do you think? Can all the electrons inside the cathode come out when heated or only a fraction will come out? Only a fraction will come out. Uh, exactly. I... So when a fraction will come out, what do you think? Which fraction will come out? Um, the outer, uh, I don't know how to explain. The, the outer ones will uh, leave because the, the inner one... ones. Yes, correct. But now see the thing is there are many spaces in which we live. Okay. There is a K space, energy space, real space. So when you say outer, it's outer with respect to what? The reciprocal space. Okay, in the momentum space, right? Momentum space, yes. Okay, so in the momentum space, what is outer and what is inner? Is it outside the Brillouin zone? Is it inside the Brillouin zone? Outside the Brillouin zone? No. So out, uh, outside the Brillouin zone can actually be mapped to inside the Brillouin zone. Remember that. Okay, see. Okay. Um, uh, let me give you an example first. So let's say this is the dispersion of free electrons. This is what we started with, correct? This is E versus K and this is for free electrons. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yeah. And yes, sir. what we also said is that there is a highest occupied level, which is E. F. Okay. But this model, in this model, the K actually goes to infinity. There is no concept of a Brillouin zone. Okay, the concept of a Brillouin zone comes in only when there is a periodic potential. Otherwise, there can be a K which can be infinite. Okay, so this model is only applicable near the center of the Brillouin zone. 
so if you are talking about a band which is very close to the center of the brillouin cone then you can make a quadratic approximation and then this is this kind of a model is valid this is called nearly free electron approximation so let's just consider this okay and what this means is that we are considering k values which are close to this right so now let's go back to the question of which are the electrons that are highly likely to escape this fermi c are the electrons which are sitting here let's say at the bottom of the conduction band are they likely to escape the fermi c or are the electrons which are closer to the fermi level likely to escape which are the ones which are more likely to escape more than more than okay let me let me uh, let me rephrase the question okay suppose i had an isolated sodium atom so from the previous discussion what is the energy i need to give this sodium atom to be able to emit the, to be able to extract the uh, 3s1 electron so the work of the ionization energy would be exactly, given exactly exactly so how much was that 5.5 5.5 very good so 5.5 electrons is what i need right mm -hmm. but then i said that the work function for a sodium crystal was much lower right 2.3 yes yeah 2.3 but is the 2.3 electron volts is this work function applicable for all the electrons inside the conduction band no only so the upper the, layer uh, that is ah, so exactly now it's the correct word it's the upper right not the outer no upper <laughs> correct so the upper means that these are electrons close to the fermi energy fermi level yes right now why am i drawing a band here it's because uh, at any finite temperature we know that the fermi function is not a step function it's going to be something like this right Hmm. so let's say this is the fermi function this is the fermi energy i'm sorry and the chemical potential i showed you that i proved to you that the chemical potential and the fermi energy are extremely close to each other even at temperatures of the order of 1000 kelvin okay so it's this band of electrons close to this which have the highest likelihood of escaping Escape. of course there are electrons here which have an even higher likelihood of escaping hmm. correct okay so the higher the energy of the electron the more likely it is to escape correct okay yes yeah yes so now now can you tell me how should i restrict this k so that i get the current density there is a restriction correct hmm this k cannot be all the k values inside the fermi c all the k values inside the fermi c will not be able to contribute to the current correct hmm yes hmm. so now from this diagram from this fermi function diagram can you tell me what is the range of k values i should consider or what is the range of energy values i should consider <clears throat> so uh, i want to consider something like this e greater than something or e less than something should i consider this limit or should i consider this limit and if i consider one of them then what should i write here any guess you can make a wrong guess it's fine if you have a if you have any logic behind it you can you can argue so the energy should be higher than the uh, work function yes so uh so it's probably i'm i don't know i'm not very sure so is it higher than the fermi energy like correct correct e greater than it is so it's not only higher than the fermi energy it's also higher than in fermi energy plus the work plus function plus the work function yes so the k should be such that the ek is greater than ef plus the work function is usually denoted by phi okay okay thank you yeah you can mute yourself so this is the restriction that we want to place on the k values okay so remember this is a one electron calculation a pretty crude calculation okay but still it uh, it is able to give us the correct formula okay so it's called the richardson dushman formula and uh, it's quite accurate um, experimentally the curve that is been obtained for the js as a function of temperature 
quite closely obeys this formula the parameters that go inside that formula are actually experimentally obtained okay it's only the functional form that we obtain from this kind of a simple theory but you will see that the parameters that we get from this simple theory are quite wrong okay the functional form is correct but the parameters are wrong okay so let's see let's go ahead and see what what we get okay so given this what i want to do is i will transform this k summation into an integral over the energy okay so we first into the k summation and in such a way that the e is greater than ef plus phi okay now <clears throat> um so let me ask uh disha are you online yeah, yeah? okay uh, just speak closer to the microphone because your voice is very faint uh okay. Uh, yeah yeah i can hear you now okay so <clears throat> now tell me so this current is now calculated in this way that we have the velocity of these electrons uh, i'm sorry i should have written here the x direction so what is the expression for vx of k if i am considering free electrons Uh, that can be obtained from the wave function, right? But it is correct. Correct. For free electrons, what is the wave function? Because remember, this is a free electron gas, correct? Yes. Yes. Uh, it is power i uh, k minus. Exactly. Electron. Yes. And from that, how do I get the velocity? Uh, first we find the momentum. Uh, correct. How do we d find that? D by d x. Uh, you uh, mean minus i h d by d x, right? Derivative. Yeah, yeah. minus i h cross d by d x. Yes. And not then, just the derivative, isn't it? Yeah, and then uh, uh, then as uh, the like momentum is m v, so uh, that momentum divided by m, correct? M. Yeah. yeah. So if I use this wave function e to the power i k dot x, it's an eigen function of the momentum operator, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So, what would be the momentum corresponding to this state? What would um, be the eigen value? K. Sorry. K. K. Well, see, I want to know what is P X. Yeah. Expect. Uh, huh. P X will be. Uh, K. Uh, H cross K X. Correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So which means the Vx will be h cross kx by m. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So let's use that h cross kx by m. Now the thing is, what I am going to ask you is that is this expression actually correct in determining the current density, or should I add something here? In the sense that. see when we are doing this sum we are saying that the uh, there are electrons in every state k and the state the electrons in the state k have a current vx and all of these electrons are contributing exactly the same amount when we do this integral okay in in other words we are saying that there is an equal likelihood of all the electrons in every state k to contribute to this current is this statement correct or should we correct this or is it incorrect and we need to uh, include a correction don't we have we have to add uh, the fermi dirac distribution right? exactly so we need to add the fermi dirac distribution function because not all the states are equally probabilistic right they don't have an equal probability and the probability of occupancy of the states varies in uh, as given by the fermi dirac distribution function good thanks you can mute yourself okay so let's substitute this we will get uh, and then we also have to add the factor of the spin so let me add that factor here itself this is due to the spin the spin up and spin down electrons both contribute equally and here also we need to have 
the Fermi Dirac distribution function. Okay. So let's uh, add all of these factors: 2e h cross by m 2 pi whole cube, then an integral from minus infinity to infinity d k y d k z, and then over d k x we have a k x and an f of e k comma t. Okay. So this k x here. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me ask. Uh, Gautam, are you online? Gautam Dash. Yes, sir. Yeah. So Gautam, what I have written here, and what I have written here, are these two expressions consistent with each other? No, sir. No, right? Yeah, good. So, what is the discrepancy? What should I do here in order to incorporate this constraint? Uh, I think you should add a dependency of states. I should add, sorry? The density of states. The density of states. Uh, not really, no. That is not the discrepancy. See, the density of states comes in when you convert the k summation into a energy integral okay see uh, when you convert let's say there is a dk of some gk and you convert this to an integral involving uh, let me not say let me say some capital h okay if i convert this to a energy integral then that dk converts to de times g of e okay so okay. this is the conversion fine so since we are staying in the momentum space there won't be a density of states factor okay but this constraint has to be incorporated somehow into this integral how do i do that what is the smallest kx Remember, the energy is also determined by the k, right? What is e k? Yes. How is e k uh, defined for free electrons? H cross square k square by 2m. Correct. H cross square mod k square by 2m. Correct. So, which is basically h cross yes. squared by 2m times k x squared plus k y squared plus k z squared. Okay. And we are now saying that this is an integral over kx, but can all kx contribute to this current? Even if kx was zero, can it contribute to the current? Or will it satisfy this constraint? It will not, right? Yes. Because if kx was zero, its energy would be zero. And zero energy will never satisfy EF yeah, plus yes, 5, greater than EF plus 5, correct? Yes. So, which means that we have to modify the lower limit of this integral. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks. You can mute yourself. So, this number has to get modified. And there has to be some K minimum. Okay, and this k minimum is found by saying that this k minimum squared is equal to EF plus the uh, work function. Okay, so this is how this k minimum is defined. Okay, and in other words, k minimum squared is basically 2m times EF plus 5 divided by h cross square. Okay. Now, see this. Uh, there is a, a small uh, correction to this. So remember, kx goes from minus infinity to infinity. So we have to keep in mind that the k minimum squared can, when we find k minimum from this, we will get both positive and negative values. Okay. But since we are considering current only in the positive kx direction, okay, 
that's why we will use only the positive k minimum okay so that's the uh, subtle point about this and we will not consider the minus k min to minus infinity part okay which is also valid because there also the energy is higher than ef plus 5 but that cannot be considered because that will contribute a current which is opposite direction okay and we are considering the current only in the plus k, plus kx direction plus x direction is this point clear or is everything in this slide clear are there any questions sorry which part last part where you said that the current be contributed to the opposite direction which we should not uh... ha ha yeah see what i'm saying is uh, ideally this integral should have been this right and this integral i can break it up this integral should ideally be written for only energies which are greater than ef plus 5 so i should write this as minus infinity to minus k min and uh, then k min to plus infinity okay is this part clear if i want to satisfy yes, this constraint yes, e is greater huh yes sir this is clear this is clear right now i have to uh, drop this part because this part will contribute to uh, current in the minus kx direction you understand we are looking at current only in the plus kx direction and not at the current which is coming out of the other surface we want to ca calculate the current coming out of one surface in a particular direction <clears throat> is that clear i understood yeah okay so uh, now we will take this expression this last expression that we have derived and analyze that so sir i am having some problem yeah, with the minimum minimum limit uh, even when kx equal to 0 yes. uh, then uh, the energy is not zero mm -hmm. uh, why is energy not zero energy is h cross squared by twice m uh, kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared ah you mean when ky kx is zero yeah yes and we can also check from the uh, ek graph that Correct. when uh, kx is zero then the energy is not zero Absolutely. i mean you're right you're right now so how are we getting that limit ah, good good question so if the kx is zero but the ky and kz are not zero will it contribute to a current in the x direction no but that's what we want right so what about this yeah uh, i can uh, understand this but uh, what about the lower uh, uh, i mean limit so you are saying that the lower limit should be so let's say take from 0 to k min and 0 to and k min to infinity okay let's break up the integral from 0 to infinity for all positive kx and take 0 to k min and k min to infinity is that the point and the question would be why are we dropping this correct yes yeah. yes so let's take ek minimum as and also if we just uh, leave the zero part we hmm. will get some non zero k values so non zero k value correct so because the ky and kz so uh, the question is kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared is 2m by h cross squared ef plus 5 okay and then kx squared will be 2m by h cross squared ef plus 5 minus kx squared plus kz squared k ky squared plus kz squared correct so the kx should be equal to square root of this whole thing okay right so your question is if i take finite ky and finite kz okay then the kx minimum will turn out to be smaller than the square root of 2m by h cross squared ef plus 5 correct um shumita that's your question right if i take yeah. ky and kz to be finite right this will contribute a finite value 
and then the kx minimum will turn out to be smaller than square root of 2m by h cross squared ef plus 5 correct uh no i i don't know if that can be uh, large than the first term uh this will not be larger than the first term you are right because the ky squared and the K, the ky squared plus kz squared i'm sorry yeah uh what will happen is that the entire energy of the system cannot be larger than ef okay yeah and the work function is added to that so this will never exceed this that is for sure but what your point is that the kx minimum being taken to be equal to square root of 2m by h cross squared ef plus pi is assuming that the ky and uh, and kz are not contributing to the energy at all yeah correct yes yeah you are absolutely right that's an assumption here okay and uh, if we take into account the kx which are smaller than kx minimum they will also contribute to the current but it would be somewhat of a uh, slightly lengthy calculation to show that if i include the terms from 0 to kx minimum in this calculation also i would get a much smaller contribution okay basically because their energy is smaller than ef uh, and smaller than ef plus 5 at least by the work function okay see the ef is here that's the highest possible energy for the electrons the ef plus 5 is somewhere here and we are talking about all the electrons which are here is that okay okay sir yeah that's the idea sir? okay so yeah sir, i had a rela uh, question related to so much of this question okay so if the lower limit of ky and kz is minus infinity and lower limit of kx is kx minimum now if we uh, uh, do kx square plus ky square plus kz square then the energy should be greater than ef plus pi <laughs> but here we are saying it is not so can Absolutely can we right. drop the ky or kz term very can good very good drop? yeah correct so even this limit of uh, plus infinity we are saying will actually take the energy beyond this uh, uh, occupied and unoccupied levels okay see the point is this there is also a fermi function sitting here what will that fermi function do so the electron energies definitely can exceed the fermi energy okay but the fermi function will basically kill them right because for all energies above ef the fermi function is zero do you see the point now option okay, yes sir yeah so yes. Uh, it's indeed the energy of the electrons can exceed the fermi energy and in fact it does in the free electron gas model the kx ky kz can go from minus infinity to infinity which means that for large values of ky and kz the energies will indeed be more much more than ef and that is what we want to exploit for thermal thermionic emission that there are unoccupied energy levels which are far below the fermi which are far above the fermi energy however the fermi function is what is killing the energies which are really far above the fermi energy okay so it's a very small window around kbt of the fermi energy which is contributing to the thermionic emission sir yeah but the temperature is not zero so fermi energy will not miss fermi function will is not exactly zero after the fermi you are right you are right and this is what we will be exploiting here the fermi function actually reduces at higher temperatures to a maxwell boltzmann distribution yeah. and even though it is not zero at extremely high energies it is exponentially small yeah mm, yes right? and that exponentially small value will contribute an exponentially small value of the current that is the idea okay in fact we will calculate what is the contribution from those also right and even though it is exponentially small we will take into account for uh, for closed form expressions we need that limit to be plus infinity okay yeah any other doubts Okay. Right. <clears throat> okay. So the next thing we will exploit is this. Suppose I take this f of e k comma t, and this is given by one over e to the power e k minus e f 
divided by kbt plus 1 okay now we want to restrict ourselves to ek values which are greater than or equal to ef plus the fermi function right so which means that the ek minus ef is greater than or equal to the work function <clears throat> now what that means is that if this is at the minimum okay the uh, ek minimum is ef plus the work function so which means that the minimum value of this is just the work function right and the work function as i said for sodium is about 2.3 electron volts and kbt even if you take off the order of say 1000 kelvin okay then even then you can see that the 2.3 electron volts is like 20 uh, 22000 or something like 25000 kelvin because one electron volt is roughly 11000 kelvin okay so you can see that uh, 25000 divided by the um, 1000 kelvin is a factor of 25 right so e to the power 25 is going to be much larger than 1 and hence the plus 1 can be neglected okay so the idea is that the fermi function reduces to e to the power minus ek minus ef divided by kbt which is just the maxwell boltzmann distribution so this fact is crucial so if you don't understand this point let me know the reduction of the fermi dirac distribution function to a maxwell boltzmann distribution is very very important okay and all this is telling you is that the fermi function here in this region is just e to the power minus e minus ef by kbt that is all this is saying okay and that's what we are going to substitute in this expression is this point clear any doubts hello sir yeah sir am i audible yes yeah yeah i sir, can hear can you can you please explain that once again yeah sure so <clears throat> i am saying here that e to the power ek minus ef by kbt has to be greater than or equal to e to the power ek minimum minus ef by kbt do you agree with this that the ek has a certain ek minimum value and the exponential of that has to be greater than or equal to exponential of the ek minimum is that is this clear yeah yeah now what is the ek minimum that we have considered for thermionic emission the minimum energy that we need for thermionic emission is that the electron should be uh, should have an energy which is equal to the fermi energy plus the work function in order to be able to escape the metal is this point clear yes sir yeah so which means that this is equal to e to the power ef plus phi minus ef by kbt and this is equal to e to the power phi divided by kbt okay and what i argued from here is that the value of phi divided by kbt is of the order of e to the power 25 even at 1000 kelvin this is such a high temperature right but even at such high temperatures the e to the power phi by kbt is of the order of e to the power 25 okay and e to the power 25 is a very large number is of the order of 10 to the power 8 okay so since this is such a large number the e to the power phi over kbt plus 1 this plus 1 can be neglected okay and the 1 over e to the power x plus 1 reduces to 1 over e to the power x which is basically e to the power minus x and that is what we okay, written okay. yeah yeah i understand yeah yeah so the fermi dirac distribution function reduces to the maxwell boltzmann distribution function at extremely high temperatures so this is a very general statement this is saying that a quantum mechanical system when you raise it to extremely high temperatures it becomes or it approaches the classical behavior okay and classically we know that the maxwell boltzmann distribution describes classical systems very well right so uh, all we are saying is there is a quantum to classical crossover and uh, essentially what we are using 
is a semi classical treatment for fermionic emission because the fermi dirac distribution function has become a maxwell boltzmann distribution however we are still using the um, the momentum operator to get the momentum and hence the velocity right so there is a quantum component there but the distribution function has become classical okay Sir, so yeah uh, i have a question yes uh, so uh, so if the temperature is uh, uh, let's say 100 kelvin mm -hmm. so is this approximation still valid it is still valid but you see the exponential will become even smaller right see the the point is this suppose i want the fermi function to be uh, as large as possible okay and the uh, the electrons which are going to escape are only beyond this ef plus the work function okay so at what temperature should i go so that this number becomes or the e to the power minus 5 over kbt becomes substantial see this is the number that i want to be substantial okay which means that when i keep on raising the temperature then the e to the power minus 5 by kbt will approach 1 as t tends to infinity yes but it approaches zero as t tends to zero yes okay so this is the reason why metals kept at room temperature will not emit electrons only when they are heated to very high temperatures of the order of 1000 kelvin will they start emitting electrons is that clear is this point clear yes sir yeah okay so <clears throat> yeah so now let's take this expression here okay and substitute the maxwell boltzmann distribution and what that will do is that that will help us to separate the kx ky kz into different components and then we can do this integral exactly okay so let's go ahead and implement that let me write this expression once again so the jx is 2 eh cross by this dky dkz <coughs> kx minimum okay so in this fermi function we are now going to substitute the maxwell boltzmann distribution which is valid at high temperatures and also for energies which are greater than ef plus 5 okay so what this will do is the following this will give us 2 e h cross okay let me write the whole thing then i'll explain integral this so this was e to the power minus okay h cross squared kx squared by 2m plus h cross squared ky squared by 2m plus h cross squared kz squared by 2m by kbt times e to the power uh, where is that thing gone okay this is all uh, minus ef Minus EF by KBT. Okay, so essentially e to the power minus EF by KBT is out. <clears throat> now uh, this thing can be now done separately. For the KX we can do it here. For the KY we can do it here, and for the KZ becomes uh, completely separable. So and these are all Gaussian integrals. So we can use the formula of e to the power minus alpha x squared dx from minus infinity to infinity as root pi by alpha. Okay. and we can also do this integral exactly if we have e to the power minus x squared x minimum to infinity also can be done okay it's uh, there is an expression which is uh, very easy to do because if you substitute x squared equal to u then this becomes x dx becomes du okay so it's a very easy integral and let me write the final expression here it's 4 pi m e by h q kbt whole square e to the power minus phi divided by kbt okay and this is called the uh, richardson dushman formula 
Now you can see why there is a e to the power minus phi by kvt which has come in. So when you do this integral for the kx, right, you will basically get the kx squared in the numerator in this exponential. And when you substitute for the kx minimum squared, which is ef, the Fermi function plus the work function, the Fermi function, will, the Fermi energy will basically cancel this Fermi energy. Okay, and uh, all you will be left with is the uh, work function, which is what is entering here. Okay, so what this is telling you is that the saturation current is uh, exponentially dependent on the inverse temperature, right? So as you keep increasing temperature, you expect to increase the current, and this is what was seen in the experiment. So remember, the experiment looked like this. This is T2 greater than T1, and this is T1. So if you fix the uh, if you fix the material and just increase the temperature at a given potential, okay. So what you will see is basically there is an increase in the saturation current. Okay. Now, now this expression is obviously a, a huge idealization. And uh, if you if you take this expression seriously, then you will see that there is a t squared also sitting here, but there is a e to the power minus phi by kvt. Okay. Uh, and using this expression, if you plot Jx divided by t squared as a function of 1 over t, then the slope can give you the work function. Okay, so uh, using this thermionic emission, you can actually figure out what is the work function of materials. And uh, this is a very important uh, uh, measurement, right? Because the work function determines a lot of the properties. For example, if you want to build interfaces, if you want to look at uh, batteries, right? Uh, if you want to look at electrolysis, then the work function is an extremely important parameter. Okay, so using this thermionic emission, one can determine the work function of systems. But uh, it turns out that <clears throat> what we have done is not exactly correct. Okay, the reason is this: what we have done is we have taken a finite barrier, and all we have said is we want to take these electrons out. Okay. We want to give these electrons some thermal energy and when they get this energy, then they will travel here and they will basically come out. That is what we have done. Okay. But remember when we solved single particle problems in quantum mechanics and we said that there are these potential barrier steps, then the electrons which come in have a finite probability to get reflected and a finite probability to get transmitted. Okay, so you used to calculate something called a reflection coefficient and a transmission coefficient, and that is what turned out to be one if there was no absorption. Okay, so effectively, what we are saying is that if there is a finite energy barrier, the electrons will not always come out. Okay, there is a finite probability of them getting reflected at this finite energy barrier. Okay, and if you take that quantum effect into account, then you will multiply another factor of. Uh, pi kbt divided by ef plus phi to the js that we have got above okay and if you multiply this then it becomes much more accurate okay but this is also not taking into account uh, any potentials that we have applied okay so uh, if we apply a potential it becomes easier to pull out the electrons because remember the work function is only giving you enough energy to take the electrons out and bring them to just the surface, right? But if the electron has to escape the dipolar field, you have to give it more energy, okay? And that energy can be supplied by the potential, right? So when you apply potential, definitely the current is going to increase because you are also going to extract the electrons which are just at the surface, right? So uh, the phi here, the work function gets modified and what you have to use inside the exponential is basically the bare work function minus this delta phi, okay, where this delta phi is given by square root of E squared times the U or actually the electric field, not just the potential, divided by 4 pi epsilon naught. Okay, so these are all expressions that come out of more complicated analysis. We are not going to do these derivations here. But these are realistic factors that one has to take into account. Okay, and <clears throat> uh, when you look at the uh, u equal to zero limit or the e equal to zero limit and compute this j s as a function of temperature, 
then using this graph of jx by t squared as a function of 1 over t you can extract the work function okay so this is what constitutes the concepts involving thermionic emission so now you can ask questions and uh, today we are not going to do the band theory oh by the way uh, before we get into questions i wanted to ask you is uh, tomorrow 4 to 5:30 doesn't seem to be a good time for me is there uh, how many of you have classes in the morning session i have class sir you have a class what time yes, sir what time uh, i have a class at 9:30 9:40 9:30 yeah. to 11 9:30 to 11 okay yeah so 9:30 to 11 is ruled out Uh, any other time uh, sorry uh, does uh, anybody else have a class at other times sir so i have a class from 11:30 yes. so from, from 11:30 to, on from 11 to 12:30 11 to 12:30 or 11:30 to 12 no 30. sir 11 to 11 to 12:30 11 to 12:30 is ruled out uh, what about uh, Okay. So I have a class from two to three. Huh? Two o'clock to three thirty. Two to three thirty. Okay, ruled out. So we still have a window of twelve thirty to two. Anyone between these two? So I have a class from eleven thirty to one. Eleven thirty to one. So which means one to two is still available. Is one to two okay with all? Anyone not okay with one to two? Good. So everyone is okay with one to two then. So can we have the class from one to two? Any objections? well you guys are not happy i understand it's lunch time okay but just uh, bear with me okay um let me find i said there's one message huh. what's the message 